Oh, thank you, Papa. We were having a transformation session with a twist. In fact, people were telling me during the session that they almost walked out of my talk. What but the twist, the twist, Papa, was the magic. So sometimes you just have to give things a bit more patience, allow yourself to experience the full intended outcome of something before you make a judgment about it. <laughs> Okay, we'll ask you to apply that theory this afternoon. I know everyone's getting tired, but hopefully you've recharged your coffee levels in the break. Uh, so we are back uh, with the next paper discussing advanced approaches to analyzing disability income experience. And that's gonna draw on experience, not just from South Africa, but also from Canada, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, once again, we'll make time for questions at the end. So please just raise a hand if you'd like us to get a mic to you. And for those joining us virtually, please use the Q&A function within the app and we'll gladly include you in the conversation as well. Without further ado, let me introduce our two speakers, Kurt Lubinger and Bruce Robertson. Welcome. Am I on? Hello, hello. Yes, there we go. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, good to be here. Thanks for making it to the graveyard shift, I think. I'm, I'm, at one point, we were wondering if we were even going to hit 10 attendees. So uh, this is a, a massive turnout <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Um, so today, uh, Quip and I are going to be presenting a paper. We are not the authors, um, so please, uh, we'll, we'll happily answer the questions we can, but anything too difficult, uh, send it to the email address and we'll, we'll forward to the authors, who in this case are our colleagues David Hatherall in Canada, um, Adele Groyer in the UK, and then Louis Rousseau, who I'm sure lots of you know from previous conventions who unfortunately couldn't be here today. So the genesis of this paper was really the disability income problems that were experienced in Australia, and I mean, just on a very high level for those of you who might not know, I mean, there was a lot of competition in the market there where increasingly more and more generous benefits were being offered, um, risk really wasn't being managed, and it, it was largely being subsidized by profits on the life side, but it got so bad to the point that the regulator there, APRA, actually started getting involved and in trying to, you know, really cut down on this behavior because they actually believed it was endangering the sustainability of the, of the industry long term. And because of that, you know, we've started looking around, you know, we write, you know, in, in the sort of where we work, in, we work across Canada, the United Kingdom, South Africa, and Australia. And we do actually, you know, those are markets where there is a large degree of disability income business. And we also wanted to make sure that, you know, any learnings that could be made from Australia were applied to those markets as well. And we also wanted to see, well, you know, by pooling all of this experience from all around the world, what, what could we learn from it? and at the same time really kind of you know, push our, our data analytics to the maximum. So that's really where this comes from. And I just wanna say at the start that we are very, very grateful to all of the, the survey respondents from, you know, from insurers around the world who did actually supply the data because otherwise it would never have been possible. So this study really took, uh, had sort of two big legs to it. The first one was a product design, product benchmarking exercise where we looked at all of the product features across the, across the world or that were sold in each of those markets by the people who responded. And we broke down those disability income products down into a whole lot of different features. So as any, I'm sure a lot of people know, you know, there's riders upon riders upon riders and various definitions and stuff that changes over time. And really try to, um, I'll go into a bit more detail, but really assess the risk of each product and try to kind of work on that. And then, of course, the more, the more typical um, actuarial leg was investigating the experience, pooling it all together, and you know, sort of comparing and contrasting. Uh, yeah, no study is complete without a long list of, of data limitations and issues. And I mean, the only thing I'll add here is that you know, it gets compounded across markets. So one of the difficulties, obviously, as a study like this is, um, you know, you, you, on, on top of the different standards between insurers, you also have different standards between different countries in terms of the data collected and how it's processed. And just here's a, you know, a long list, I won't go through all of them, but I mean, particularly different treatment of accident and sickness claims, for example, um, between, insur between different markets. You know, in some markets, that's a major driver of the experience and a major product feature. In others, it's completely immaterial. So in that case, then claim cause isn't captured consistently and trying to compare that experience really becomes quite difficult. So just to give you an idea of so that sort of the range of products we saw, I mean, it is a complete um, range of different deferred periods and benefit periods. So looking at the limited payment period, so all going all the way from, you know, sort of the two years all the way up to the standard sort of, you know, age 65 payment. Looking at the very, very short deferred periods as well, or what we'll often call waiting periods in this market, um, you know, going from seven days all the way up to, you know, two years. 
occupation definitions, as well as you know, different disability definitions, um, the treatment of partial versus total disability, and the extent to which you know, partial disability is a benefit that's, is a condition that's actually eligible for benefit payment. And then what was also quite interesting was seeing the, you know, the degree of um, financial underwriting and control that was then applied at claim stage as well, and the extent to which um, you know, over-insurance and that other thing was reassessed at the point of claim. And, oh, and the other one, of course, being aggregation with, you know, sta with either state benefits or employer benefits um, to the extent to which that was used to reduce disability income uh, claim amounts. Ah, there we go. Sorry, skipped ahead there. Um, yeah, so because of this huge range of products and what we really wanted to do was try to tease out, you know, what are product features, what are market features, and what really drives experience, you know, the sheer number of permutations of, um, these, pro of these different product features made things very, very difficult. And so what we tried to do was actually to just assign a single score to each product using a variety of features. Um, and of course, this is highly subjective, so it's really just in conjunction with looking at, you know, with our, with our claims teams, with our underwriters, and just trying to put, you know, a number to everything. Highly subjective, but we think it worked quite well. We, you know, looked at each of the features, scoring either, you know, going up to zero to 100%, and that's measuring your total sustainability. And then it's effectively a weighted average. So just to give you a, a brief summary of sort of what this could look like, so product one, product two here. So product one, you know, even though it's um, its own occupation, which is obviously not a, a very desirable feature, it's highly, you know, much harder to assess claims. Um, and sick pay is not deducted from the benefit amount and is a fairly high replacement ratio, um, but benefits are only payable for five years. So how do you compare that against, you know, in this example, product two, where um, you've got, you know, benefits payable all the way to age 65, but you have an activities of daily living definition, which is much, much stricter um, and much more um, objective in, in applying it. And so, you know, you can see in this case, we've got a 77% sustainability score for product one and 100% for product two. And, you know, just looking at these, you know, and again, this is a sample of the, the 75 different product features that we were looking at, but in some ways this, you know, just gives you an idea of how difficult it can be to compare products unless you do apply some sort of scorecard here. So what actually happened if anyone's feeling competitive and proudly South African? Um, you'll be happy to see that South Africa actually scored the highest out of all of the regions in terms of sustainable products um, at 75%. And you really can see quite a big split there, but you know, 75, 60, obviously quite close. But Australia and Canada scoring much, much lower on average. And in particular, the, um, you'll see Australia there split out between the old products and the new products. That actually refers to the older products or the old gen products were sold before the regulator got involved. Um, and you can see that's, you know, even though they're still scoring relatively low now, it is a, a marked improvement from where we believe the products were sitting. Um, what did make the analysis a little bit more difficult was that we did see that, um, that, pro that, sustain that countries clustered around similar sustainability scores. So this is an attempt at a visual representation here, so the, um, the axes don't mean anything. So um, don't, don't worry about where everyone is placed so much as how close they are to each other. And what you can see is that with the exception of Canada and New Zealand, the, um, the countries all tend to cluster together. So you've got Australia sitting sort of all by themselves, the UK also sitting very, very tightly with all of those respondents, South Africa on their own, and then New Zealand and, uh, and Canada being sort of their own cluster. Um, and, and this makes sense. I mean, people tend to you know, sell products that are similar to their competitors, and you need to match competitors' products to a certain extent to remain competitive. Um, but it does uh, complicate the analysis because it does actually mean that you end up with you know, high uh, sort of collinearities between sustainability and country. So now to get into, so that completes sort of the, the first leg of the product assessment, now getting into the more, uh, the more detailed experience summary. Um, it is important to note that in the paper and the data that was submitted, we did not receive linear data from everyone or over the same period. So as anyone knows, you know, data provided for studies is always on a, on a best efforts basis. Um, again, South Africa happily leading the charge there with the, with the longest data period, so always nice to see. And we did have a fairly good number of respondents quite spread out. Um, Canada was sort of the, the country with the lowest respondents, and you'll see in some cases we have removed them from the, the paper, the analyses in the paper, just to you know, 
preserve some measure of anonymity. Yeah, and then this is looking at, so obviously, you know, being a disability income um, study, you know, you've got, you've got two, effectively two data sets you need to work with, so you've got to look at claim inceptions as well as uh, terminations once they are in claim. And it's quite nice to see, I mean, a, a really, really nice volume of data, um, peaking at a million life years in the case of the, um, in the case of the inceptions data, and terminations also similarly high. So, I mean, a really, really nice volume of data overall. Um, and that, that tail off you can see there is because of that, um, if we go back one slide, is just because of the, the fall off in data submitted um, from some other countries. So the experience analysis, I mean, I think this is fairly, all fairly standard up to a certain point, so we obviously need to adjust for reporting delays, and I'll speak a little bit more on that. Um, and then the process we took was, you know, to first to preserve, uh, produce crude rates, which is just always useful as a sense check and to make sure you're understanding the data and things look reasonable. Then going on to our actual versus expected um, against the standard table, which we will share. And then Coop will take us through the, the real sort of modeling we did. And I think that's, you know, some of the benefits that this uh, paper has shown is that, you know, where you are dealing with, you know, relatively complex data sets, um, you know, the traditional thing of uh, graphing your A versus E's and, you know, trying to shift things around by hand doesn't really work so well. And that is, yeah, a number of features drive the experience there. So in adjusting for reporting delays, um, we do follow the, the Ebna factor. So I think there's a reference there to um, <laughs> Louis, uh, Louis' old paper in 2007 that he published. Um, Ebna is very, very similar to a standard IBNR approach, except you just reduce your exposure for the, the level of um, reporting that's expected. Um, it does generally produce slightly smoother results and also has the added benefit of it um, replacing placing less weight on the periods which are more influenced by IBNR. So this gives you, this graph gives you an idea of sort of what the IBNR and the completeness was like across the various regions by year. Um, again, you can see, so 2018 relatively complete for all clients, 2019 running down a bit lower, especially for New Zealand because they only submitted data up to 2019 and then, yeah, running on for the UK and South Africa. Um, yeah, and it does just show, I mean, that sometimes these, these, uh, these delays can be quite significant and the adjustments are quite large, so we do just need to keep that in mind. Okay, so crude, crude experience, obviously, um, not always uh, particularly helpful to look at. Um, so there's no adjustment in the coming graphs between um, any, um, in terms of business mix or change in deferred periods or anything like that, but it does just give some measure of sort of the absolute level of claims and terminations that you're seeing. So looking at the crude experience by country, I mean, it is notable even though these are completely um, unadjusted rates or, you know, sort of rates that have no real allowance for any weighting. You can see Australia is already showing uh, much higher, um, well, generally higher incidence rates and much lower terminations than you do see in the... Um, in, in the overall market, the UK much, much lower, and everyone else kind of much, much lower incidence, I should say, sorry. Um, and South Africa, again, also a noticeable outlier in terms of the level of the, um, the absolute level of the terminations. Obviously, crude rate's not particularly helpful, so the next step we went through was the actual versus expected. We used the Society of Actuaries um, IDI basis. Um, this was partly because we didn't want to use any of the tables from any of the individual regions that might already have been fit to some of the experience. So, you know, you didn't want to make, uh, didn't want to prejudice the other regions at the expense of that table. So we've used the Society of Actuaries. And again, yeah, and again, you can see some of that now. This has changed the overall shapes of the graphs quite a bit. So you can see correcting for deferred period makes quite a big difference. But it is very, very noticeable. Um, yeah, the, the treatment of, the, of pregnancy claims in the U.S. is very, very different, which is why you see it's such a poor fit um, on the expected basis for females, we believe, um, compared to the rest. The um, male rates slightly better, but still quite significantly lower than expected. But overall, you can see Australia still running at the highest level compared to everyone, um, with New Zealand, South Africa, and the U.K. all at similar, well, New Zealand, South Africa, similar levels, U.K. again even lower. But Australia, a noticeable outlier in, term of, in terms of termination. So the only region sitting below 100%. But yeah, as we said, that's a, 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 rather, a, a rather tangled mess to try to, um, try to handle by hand or by eye. And uh, Coop will now take us through just yeah, what we think is a, a better approach. Okay. Um, thanks, Bruce. So yeah, Bruce has painted a picture of, of uh, you know, a very nice and, and big data set. 
Um, and it's quite exciting to see that experience across it, but how do we now approach assessing this experience? And diving into the, the nice technical formula, which I'm sure all excites you. Um, so these are quite, uh, quite standard formulas for, for GLMs, or, uh, we, and specifically we'll use a lasso regression or lasso regression, as some mention it. Uh, um, there's been ma numerous mentions about these regressions in recent years in the convention, and, and they are really useful. I'll, I'll go into it a bit more about the specific lasso uh, workings and so on, but let's start with the formula. So what, we, um, what we're modeling is both inceptions and terminations, and then the theta here is the number of claims incepting, and then um, the theta is, a, is a, a, um, a function of beta zero, which is the intercept parameter. Uh, the sum of beta i's, which are the coefficients corresponding to the covariate xi, and then the log of your central claim instance rates, and then your, also your central exposure risk, and then an adjustment for i, b, and r. So if you haven't looked at these uh, formulas in a while, it's actually quite simple. The log term is just your expected basis. So that's the, um, the CDI, or uh, I, I see, ICI, I IDI, I, that one, um, IDI table, um, that Bruce mentioned earlier, so that is just your expected basis, and then what your beta zero does is it, it moves that basis up or down, you know, in, uh, as a whole, and then your, your beta i, x i's are, would then adjust for specific factors, so maybe there's a, a specific male adjustment, the beta i would then adjust it for that, so that's not too complex, and then obviously terminations is quite similar. Now the reasons for using lasso regressions, um, regression, uh, I think I've, um, I'm quite passionate about lasso regression, so please feel free to come and talk to me about it afterwards. Um, having, having done pricing on, on more traditional approaches where you, where you kind of, you know, adjust factors and then, you know, look at the remaining adjustments and continue adjusting factors, uh, and also having, having used a bit of GLMs just, just straight out, I can, I can clearly say that using those approaches in this kind of project would have been daunting. Um, the, the amount of variables that we have, the amount of complexity, the amount of judgment that, that would have required would have been quite, uh, quite a process that, that would have taken ages. Um, if you haven't used Lasso before, it's, it's a very, very nice in terms of pricing. It, it's a very good way to get you to, um, to a really good answer in a very, um, in a very quick way as well. So, Must I hold it? Ah, that makes a massive difference, sorry. Um, oh, goodness. Okay, so lasso is good in summary. There was a formula before this. Um, <laughs> okay, so what lasso does is it helps you with variable and interaction selection, and it does so by using something called cross-validation. Um, I'm going into detail because I like it, and I want you all to use this. Um, there's uh, cross-validation kind of... Again. Okay, there we go. Cross validation splits your data into uh, components, and then what the Lasso model does is it runs loads of fits across these data sections, and then it looks over these data sections and it finds a uh, the model that fits all of these best. So, so that's kind of the short explanation of cross validation, and this is also really good to deal with collinearity, which is um, which is obviously very present in a data set like this. There's also a penalty parameter that reduces the amount of variables that you get to so make it a simple model, and then um, the outputs are obviously comparable to a GLM, which a lot of people can understand and we're able to understand what the model actually suggests and it, it helps you to, to really interrogate what it does and, and understand the result. Um, also live its overfit and then it requires less judgment in the data preparation which was particularly nice in this, in this case. Uh, and then it also allows for the blending of your standard tables and your experience. So if you think we've got expected basis, we can tell the model that we expect something and then the model makes adjustments on top of that. Okay, so after we've now applied this lasso model, we um, we obviously want to want to um, look at the benefits that we'll be able to get from that. So the 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 one thing is that it obviously fits to your traditional kind of rating factors. It gives you um, adjustments by age and and by gender and so on. But then also we can look at at some more you know. Um, you know, higher level comparisons, and specifically cross-country com com uh, comparisons can be done. So we can identify areas that are similar across these countries. So maybe uh, gender has a similar effect on, 
on DI experience, and we can identify that and be sure that we, we understand the results and that, that bolsters kind of our understanding of inc uh, disability income in general. And then um, it's also then assessing the, the impact of new product features. So if one a product feature was prevalent in, a diff or is, um, in, a, in one of the markets, we can look at, at, at how that probable impact back can be in different markets as well. And obviously it highlights risk, key risk areas in product design, that's Australia, what Bruce talked about. And, um, and then once you, once you know and you split out kind of the drivers of, of, um, of the experience, you can still see kind of, you know, maybe Australia has a, has a, has a factor that is still way worse, but it's not explained by a traditional, um, by a traditional rating factor. And then we can start discussions to think about, you know, what does the effect of uh, different stakeholders have across the market. What maybe there is, uh, you know, a claims culture, a claim culture in in this uh, society that is uh, that's different to to other to uh, to the, for instance, the South African society. If you think of Australia, and then also maybe some claim processes, so you can start looking at those things, and also maybe some interactions from brokers and and how they've driven these experiences. So that's quite helpful, and obviously overall it helps us to understand disability income experience. Then the cross-company comparisons is also uh, useful to help discriminate between homogenous features within the country. So this, this kind of refers to if you have two, country, two companies in different countries and you want to start exper comparing experience across those two companies, that becomes a bit difficult because you know, there's a lot of things going into the experience of a single company. But if you group these companies and you start to look at uh, those features in one, co one country and you compare that to the features in, the, in another company, there's a lot more understanding that you can, you can have by having more certainty about the results. Okay, so actual versus predicted results. So this is what we get after we've modeled. Um, the model outputs new predicted results that, that um, um, you know, it's similar to your A versus E's, and, and, but we kind of call it A versus P's. It's now your new rates that, that you get after having modeled it and having fit all your factors. And what you want to see from a model is you want to see ratios that are quite close to 100% A versus P's across your big you know, categories. It obviously won't fit uh, across all categories because then you've kind of overfitted. Um, and if you look at this, you can see actual was predicted by inceptions by country and terminations also by country. I think in the, the coming slides, we'll always have the, the incidents on the one side and the termination on the other side and kind of this is the structure that we're going through. And you can see for all the, country, uh, for all the countries and then for genders, there's a, a basically 100% A versus P, which indicates a good fit to the model. Okay, so um, when we do look at the, the model output, what we show here, um, we have standardized the mix of lives. So we've, we've looked at the standard mix of lives. We've used the predicted rates on those standard mix of lives so that you can compare apples by apples. So if, you, if you're seeing um, you know, a difference between one rating, uh, uh, between companies in, or countries in the rating factor, then you can know that is actually a difference that's assigned by the model and it's not just an underlying distribution thing. Uh, and then it will show the predicted inceptions rate uh, per one unit annual benefit coverage per annum and the predicted termination rate per one uh, unit annual benefits coverage per month. So those are quite standard definitions of these rates in the industry. And then the intention of the modeling is to summarize and do compare features and, um, you know, there is additional uh, modeling required if you want to use this for pricing purposes. In other words, please don't use this for pricing your stuff. Um, there's, the, yeah, there's a lot of details that go into that and a lot of assumptions and so on and, you know, we are using this for a comparison. The, the, um, the goal of this paper is not to price um, uh, products across all the markets. Um, okay, so... First one, sustainability score. What we can see here is that the highest claim exceptions for the low sustainability score group, uh, yeah, there's the highest claim exceptions for the low sustainability scores group, so that is kind of what we expected from, from what Bruce kind of saw us. And then the middle and the high uh, group is, a, is quite a bit lower from that. Although if you look at terminations, that difference becomes much less. So across these sustainability sc uh, scores, the, the termination rate is, is reasonably similar, or more similar to say that it better. Now, I must say that um, we, when we were modeling this, we did give the model both sustainability score and country. Um, and as Bruce mentioned before, those are very correlated. So the modeling did not highlight sustainability score as a key, um, as a key driver, it rather stuck to country. So you'd... Um, 
it basically just said, you know, country is a good explanation. But that, that does make sense given the, the high correlation. Also to note is we, we did not standardize these specific graphs by sustainability score, um, but we'll still, you, you, if we did, we would still see the very much similar results because of the correlation again. Okay, so output by country, again, Australia is the region with the highest overall claim inception rates for both male and females, and also the lowest predicted termination rates. Now, I don't know, I can't remember if Bruce mentioned this, but, oh, that's loud again. Um, I don't know if Bruce mentioned this, but you'd obviously, when you see high inceptions, you always, or you would expect high termination. So, you know, um, if you, uh, a high inception would be um, something that's easier to claim for generally, and then something that's easier to claim for would also be something that you generally would recover from sooner. So we're not seeing that for Australia, which is you know, part of the problem, obviously. Um, uh, what we can say and what we're very proud of, especially in the World Cup here, is that South Africa is doing really well in the termination side. Um, the, and, and we do have the other region with the highest average termination rates. Then it's also interesting to note that the UK has a big difference by gender, so female's incidences are quite a bit higher than male incidences, and then the New Zealand also has that uh, as a difference between the genders, but then male terminations is quite a bit higher than female terminations. Again, um, the, in the New Zealand market specifically, there's a high proportion of accidental claims, and obviously males are more prone to you know, accidental accidents, and um, accidents tend to have, a, have a, a quicker recovery time. And if you think about New Zealand with all the rugby going on there, you know, that does make sense again. So, done with rugby now. Um, the, okay, then we're going to predicted claim inceptions by the deferred period. Um, so this is yeah, how long you need to kind of be dis, um, uh, disabled or sick to be able to claim. And as you'd expect, a short... A short um, Deferred period would have very high inceptions, and then that kind of goes down. I think it's it's worth to note that the 30-day deferred period is kind of the most prevalent across all the markets. Um, yeah, and then on the on the termination side, you'll see that the you also get higher terminations for that shorter deferred periods. But yeah, it's obviously a bit of a more flatter shape when you come to the longer deferred period. Then predicted claim inceptions by attained age. So I'll take you, um, I hope you can see these graphs um, on, the, on the left, left, hand side. left, left hand side. right hand side. Um, males uh, um, inceptions rates are flat prior to age 30, so that's the blue line, and then that increases quite steadily, and then female rates are, is, is a bit um, more linear, and they, uh, female rates becomes higher than male rates past age 27. Um, then on the, on the termination by age uh, graph, so um, I'll take a bit to explain this graph, it's a bit more complex. Um, what we're showing here is again your, your uh, chance or your rate of termination across age, but then we break that up by how long you've been in claim. So the top line there, the black graph there, is if you've been in claim for six months, then you would, um, you'd, uh, between ages 20 and 30, you'd be more likely to, uh, to to uh, terminate compared to ages 50 and 60. And then you can see uh, the longer that you are in, in claim, the, uh, the more that kind of uh, reduces the, the chance of termination, which I think is, that's quite expected. And then, you know, ov obviously the impact on age also seems to become a bit less, although there is still a bit of a, 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 a bump there. Okay. Um, now this, I think we'll spend a bit of time on the occupation class. This is, this is quite interesting. Um, the predicted claim in inceptions by occupation class on the incidence side, yeah, so this is here. Um, so what we'll see is that classes one and two, um, they've got quite low inception rates. Um, and, and then if you move a class to the more, more manual classes, then you see that that does increase. Again, you know, a bit of manual injuries or manual dis disabilities across these, these occupations. Um, now, what Bruce mentioned earlier again is that it's, a, it's quite hard to distinguish by occupation class uh, from the data that we do have, um, or not distinguish, it's hard to categorize the occupations very uh, similarly. Uh, some occupations are deal dealt with very differently between, the, uh, between uh, countries, but also between companies. So if you think of maybe the medical professions, doctors and so on, some people would place them in, in, in different 
in different classes. So we have tried to 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 allow for that and to control for that, but yeah, you would you would exp uh, that it, that was quite a difficult thing to do. But I think these results are still quite useful. Um, if we move over to the termination side, we will see that, for especially for males, um, the lowest uh, the uh, occupation class one, which is obviously the less manual occupation class, has um, has has the lowest termination rates, and then occupation classes two, three, and four have higher termination rates. Now, again, that does show higher incidence, higher termination, but I think this is quite interesting that you know your occupation class two, three, and four have reasonably similar, um, you might have expected um, higher terminations for classes three and four even, uh, but we're not seeing that in this data. And then also what's interesting, uh, I don't have a, have a square for that, but uh, if you look at the female rates on the termination side, you'll see that um, classes one, two, and three are quite similar again, and only at class four, the, the terminations increases for that. Um, it, it might also be interesting to note on the incidence side that your uh, classes one and two, the female incidence rates are higher, and then the males become higher after that. I think that could be, you know, maybe linked to some of the conditions that that's claimed under, and um, and so on. So yeah, quite an interesting finding there. And then this kind of leads us to the conclusion. Um, so under understanding the disability uh, experience is complex. There's a lot of factors in there. Um, we've been able to model. Um, a good fit on your traditional rating factors. So we've got a, we, we understand what age does, we understand what gender does, we understand those kind of things. But we do remain with a big, fac uh, a big um, country factor that, that, that is there. So there's a clear indication that there are other things and other factors that are influencing um, experience across these countries. So those can be product features, market conditions, and they vary considerably across these countries, resulting in the difference experience that we see. And there's a, there's a number of drivers to the experience. I mean, we, uh, and it's definitely something that, that could be looked in more and that we are looking in more with this data set. Um, where possible with the data set, but also with discussions um, yeah, with the uh, numerous participants. And then the, the lesser regression side obviously helped us to, to again, um, map these traditional factors, but it also helped us to find some, some additional key insights. So we've got lighter experience for products just to be more sustainable. We've got, uh, we've got heavier experience in Australia, which is correlated to, to, the, to the less sustainable products. And then we also have heavy, heavy inceptions for the more manual occupation classes, and that is to some extent offset by lighter termination experience. Okay, and um, then finally, just to, to thank the participants again, uh, without the data, it, this would have not have been possible. And um, then finally, we'd just like to uh, end on a disclaimer to say again that uh, this, this paper does, uh, is, uh, is prepared for information purposes and the material and sources believed are to be reliable from the data provided and analyzed by Jenry. Um, so don't use it for your pricing, <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, thank you very much and, and we're, we're very eager to, to have questions. I think we're quite, quite soon. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kerp and Bruce. Um, let's open to the floor. If you would like to ask a question, please raise a hand. We've got roving microphones we'll bring to you. Uh, no questions through in the app as yet, but uh, that could change. So please keep them coming if you're listening on the virtual stream and would like to engage. Uh, please just pop those through in the Q&A. Do we have any hands up in the room? Seems like it was a very clear presentation. Yeah. Katleko, anything you'd like to ask? Uh, you know what, um, Pepe, I, I, I saw on the presentation that it said intermediate for life insurance actuaries, and I consider myself an amateur. <laughs> so let me not uh, delve into what is <laughs> unknown. But uh, maybe a, a question to say, practically, what do you expect or think would be meaningful and useful um, for the profession, for life actuaries, having seen the potential benefits from these analyses across the different regions and countries in terms of implementing it in our current market uh, space. Let me try a part of that. I think, um, I think seeing what is being done in a different market is always valuable, right? Um, and specifically because um, um, you know, there, there are different players in this market. I think the, the Australian uh, experience is a good example of where things can go really bad, um, you know, with with the presence of a lot of actuaries and a lot of smart people 
being there overseeing these products and and it going wrong so I think I think this kind of paper is useful to just you know um, to, to, to take to highlight that to show how how big that kind of you know almost slippage can be um, but also to say you know that that um, uh, but also then to learn from from each other in terms of the positive sides I think there's um, yeah there, there's there's um, um, there's insights to be gained from from how um, just the normal shapes of the, the curves and all of those things it's it's quite useful to, to look at um, yeah. uh, to better understand our disability income experience in short thank you, thank you. This is from the floor. Wh what question would you have liked <laughs> to receive uh, from everyone attending this session? Yeah, no, um, yeah, I don't, uh, as, not, as, as not being one of the authors, I'm quite happy to not see too many questions. So um, <laughs> direct all your questions to Louis. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a nice paper. I mean, yeah, I can say that not having been involved myself. And yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest question for me coming out of it was sort of, well, how much, you know, given that clustering of, of product features, mm. how, do you, how do you explain sort of the variance between the, oh, we have an actual question. <laughs> how do you explain the variance between the, um, the, different, um, the different markets? And I mean, it is quite interesting that the model, I mean, it's, it's kind of weird talking about the, the model, um, but the model selected, you know, country over, over um, over product features, which mm. either means our subjective scoring wasn't correct, which might, you know, we have to be open to that possibility, mm -hmm. but also I think it points to the importance of, you know, the market in which you operate and understanding how quickly that can change. So in Australia, a lot of the experience was being driven by um, personal injury lawyers, greater awareness of benefits, greater benefit utilization, and I think there are a lot of products in South Africa um, which do are to a certain extent subsidized by a lack of utilization rather than people not qualifying for benefits. And I think, you know, Australia is a bit of a test case in why that can be a problem. Mm. Right, we now have a question from the floor, plus a few coming in on the app. Please keep those coming, but let's start with the floor. Good afternoon. Hi, thank you so much. Um, it's just a simple question on um, COVID, because I saw that the, for other countries you had data for 2020 and 2021. So I was just wondering how you were able to take that into account and in cases where you didn't have the actual causes, if you had made any adjustments for that, because I can imagine that some of the causes are not explicitly COVID, it could be something else, but um, heavily driven by that. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm trying to think, I think in South Africa is the, the main COVID hit by these things, uh, maybe the UK as well. Um, yeah, I think the, the, what, we, what we would have looked at, and I haven't looked at that specifically, so what I assume I um, was looked at is, we would have looked at the experience in 2020 and 21, and we would have seen you know, if there are um, you know, drastic changes, and, and I think that would have been then dealt with in these results, so that would have probably been, um, been excluded into detail. So, so again, there's a lot of details that go into analysis like this. I think we do, you know, we, we, we plot these results extensively and we would look at that and then I think if we do, if we would have seen some kind of outlier due to COVID that, that would not, not have made it into this, um, into these results. So yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. From the app, Dylan asking, what are the drivers of the Australian experience being so different to other markets? Sorry, in the app, Dylan asking, what are the drivers of the Australian experience being so different to the other markets? Um, yeah, I mean, there is that product system. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's a paper, refer a white paper, um, referenced in, in, the, in the paper, I think, by Andres Febersinke, which goes into quite a bit of detail trying to unpack what exactly went wrong in Australia. So for anyone who's really interested, I would, would suggest looking at that. Um, but I think you ha it was a little bit of a perfect storm where I think you had... Um, very gener a very, very competitive landscape and where they were experiencing a lot of profits from on the life side, which they were using to subsidize losses. So there was no real pressure on this line of business to be profitable in and of itself. Um, you also had um, a lot of, <coughs> like I said, um, benefit awareness and uh, quite a litigious 
claim culture came about, so people were very happy to take their insurers to court. Um, the OMBA there was being quite generous towards claimants as well, so there was very much a, um, I shouldn't say a culture of the insurer is wrong, but I think that was sort of to, to very much summarize. Um, and like I say, so yeah, and you had a combination then of all of those come together. I think there were issues also with upskilling of claims teams and the degree to which they were experienced to assess um, disability claims. And that, all of that kind of came together at once to, to drive everything. Mm. Um, but I, I think, I mean, the major blame is on just people pursuing business gro new business growth at the and, competition and keeping up with competitors um, at the expense of managing product line profitability, mm. basically. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe also to note, and maybe this is to your question earlier, uh, I think for South Africa, it's nice to sit here and look at this, right? It's not, it looks like we're doing a good job. But this, this paper has been presented at the, uh, at the Australian, at the International Actuaries Association uh, Convention. Uh, it's been presented in the UK and it's presented in Canada. And I think um, specifically in, in some of those markets, if you sit in Canada, um, I don't know if you remember the sustainability score that was there and, um, and seen some of the the results there. So I think for, for actually in Canada, this is, this is also very useful to look at and to say, oh, hang on, you know, are we, are we looking at these things right? What product features do make sense? So, so maybe, you know, we can be a bit of a, um, you know, reasonable poster boy in this sense, but, but that is, that does, that does add value, I think, across the world. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, yeah. I think it links to the question that we got from Jared on, on the app where he was asking, I mean, as a follow up to the paper, do you have recommendations in terms of sustainable dis uh, disability income uh, products? Yeah, so I think we, we are working on these things. What, what we're doing with this paper and what we're doing is we are um, we, uh, we're engaging with the specific participants. So um, we are going into more details about the results for the people that participated in this um, in, the, in the survey, and we will be, you know, um, showing them a lot more detail, showing them a lot more insights, and also then, as part of that, if there are, you know, concerns or things, and then we are able to to show them what we found and, and give them alternatives to that. Um, I think a, yeah, comparing products is difficult. Um, changing um, a market does converge, like we, we saw. Uh, changing a market is not something that's it's easy, so um, I think we, we, the approach is to, to just uh, um, interact with the companies. Um, I mean, it, it's, not, it's nothing new, I think, if, if that, w that we see, it's just a, it's a good way of representing it um, and, and analyzing something complex, so. Thank you, we've got a question at the back of the room, I believe. So Hi. you mentioned something, I don't think you used the exact words, but lack of understanding of benefits in South Africa or underutilization of benefits. I mean, sure, that's great for life insurance. Sorry, just, just hold on. We're struggling to hear you. I think our presenters just would like if you, re if you can restart the question and maybe just bring the mic closer to your mouth, please, if you don't mind. Okay, can you hear me better now? Um, so you mentioned something along the lines of underutilization or, or lack of understanding of benefits in South Africa. I mean, so sure, that's great for life insurers, but doesn't that create a problem where maybe products are being sold incorrectly or members are, or, you know, um, claimants or beneficiaries of, of the products are not using those. And over time, if they do start under, or do start understanding the benefits and claiming more, that could create a, a problem. Um, and, and isn't that lack of communication from the life insurers, I mean, isn't that a cause for concern? Yeah, sorry, I mean, I think that was, I mean, maybe I didn't express myself properly. I mean, I think that's exactly why Australia is a bit of a, a warning. So, I mean, I think individual disability income in South Africa is probably not the, the market I would say we've got a problem with that in. I mean, I think it's generally sold. It's, it's a relatively expensive product sold to quite financially sophisticated consumers. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure there are cases where there's underutilization, but I don't think that would be the product line where I see the biggest problem is. But I do think you're right. I mean, it, it is uh, on those benefit lines where you do ex have that experience. You know, I think in Australia is a test case where people can really start making sure they absolutely maximize their claims. And if you start suddenly needing to, and if you're trying to suddenly start really strictly enforcing policy conditions leading to more declines, negative press, um, yeah, you find yourself in a very difficult position, I think, very quickly. 
We have a hand in the front of the room. While we bring a microphone forward, let me go to the app. Milan uh, asking, does the high inception and terminations rates for more manual occupation classes make the case for allowing more of these occupations in DI products? Yeah, I mean, I think generally there aren't many, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't think, I mean, by definition, those are all occupations which have been allowed to purchase disability income products. Um, so, I mean, I know there are certain occupations where traditionally we would only offer something with an ADL definition or a non-occupation based definition and typically only on a lump sum basis. I think, yeah, I mean, there's nothing in those occupation results that I think would make us question the, necessarily that would, you know, and unfortunately the study can only speak to the occupations that are included. So, um, I mean, possibly, but I wouldn't, I, I don't think you can draw that conclusion from the, from the study. Thank you. Back to the floor. Hi, it's Sarah Bennett. Um, two questions. One is on the lasso uh, method. Um, I'm not familiar with it, but I, I just wanted to know um, how it, or the advantages of the method, and it seems to zero rise um, insignificant um, explanatory variables, but I'd just like to understand that a bit better. And then secondly, was any analysis done by cause of claim? So for example, are there more um, claims due to mental health in South Africa, for example? Thanks. Thank you. Echoing that second question, by the way, echoing another one on the, okay. on the app from Vincent. So, straight to you. Yeah, okay. Um, the lasso does zero eyes. It's a, it's a long technical chat. Um, I'm very happy to have it. Um, it it's a combination of... Um, okay, how to, how to answer it very quickly. Um, okay, so... On the one side, it's a combination of, um, of the, the penalty factor that it is. So there is, in, in the structure of the model and how it works, it does, it does um, um, penalize any two more, more, ra uh, more rating factors. So, so that's one uh, element of it. The cross-validation also helps. So um, that, uh, you know, maybe a small factor where the small data would have to uh, have a significance that would have to have a significant impact across different sections of the data to be included in the model, right? So I think that that cross validation is quite useful because of that. So you can't, if you if you see that only at, uh, in one cut of the data, then it probably won't be selected in the final model that's there. But that being said, um, I have done many of these uh, lasso. Um, um, I've done many. I've seen many cases where uh, maybe a small variable actually is included, but then the experience was drastically different for that variable, and that that is also really good. So you, uh, if you'd see like a, you know doubling in claims for a very uh, small kind of you know cohort, then it doesn't necessarily also throw that out. It does include that, and then there is obviously judgment that comes into that then. But it is quite useful that it that it works in this way. So I, I hope that answers the question. But happy to talk further about it. Um, and then the next one is then about your. Uh, just remind me about it. Um, uh, the impact. So what are the drivers, rather, um, that are causing? I mean, thinking of things like uh, mental wellness. Mental illness. Oh yes, yes, yes. So that's that's very exciting. But unfortunately, we don't have. Um, okay. So doing an analytics on on those kind of um, claim causes is obviously wonderful to be able to do, but we are very constrained with the data that we have. So um, the, the, the causes wasn't provided consistently across markets, it wasn't available in the markets, and a lot of work is needed to clean that kind of data up. So you can just imagine if you've got, you know, mental illness can be spelled in 20 different ways and those kind of, you know, if you've done these kind of data analytics, you know the, the time that it will take. However, that being said, it is one of the focuses that we are focusing on with this data set. So we are, uh, where we where it's possible, we are starting to look at those things because that's obviously very, very interesting. And, and that is also part of the kind of, um, if possible, that we want to give some feedback to the companies uh, where they actually did provide that kind of data to us in a, in a way that, that we can use it. So, uh, so that is a very interesting you know, future thing that we are, we are working on. Um, yeah. Thank you. We've got another question on the floor. If we can get a microphone to the gentleman in the green shirt. I just wanted to ask two questions. Um, when looking at individual countries and how their features clustered, did they cluster and become more concentrated over time? 
And did you also understand why they clustered in certain areas? So why did South Africa become more sustainable versus the UK and New Zealand? I think it's a short answer there is we didn't look at it over time. Um, yeah, I, I think um, they might, that might be something to look at. I don't know. I suppose, yeah, you could see changes over 10 years. It's a long period, right? But we, yeah, we didn't look at it. It might be something to look at. Um, I, I, to, to say why would be hard, I think the simple answer there would be just market forces. And if one company brings out something that's very attractive to sell, then there's some forces for other companies to also do that. So can I just add, I mean, obviously the one, just to jump in, the, I mean, the, the one exception to that is obviously in Australia where we did have to separate out the old and the new products. So that was where we did see, a, a, and we knew there was a, a marked shift in sort of the type of products being sold and the terms and conditions. Um, so yeah, that's a, a bit of a special case. Do we have any other questions from the floor? Going once. Going twice. No, I'm just going to do one last check There's on the nothing app. On nothing new through on the app. So I think we can wrap up there. Uh, Bruce and Coop, thank you so much to both of you. And uh, also just to acknowledge again, uh, David Hatherall, Adele Groyer, and Louis Rousseau, who wrote the paper that they presented for us so, uh, so well today. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you, everybody, for attending. We've got about eight minutes in hand before the final session of the day starts. So if everybody wants to stretch their legs, take a good bathroom break, grab one last cup of coffee downstairs, we will reconvene in, in eight or so minutes' time at 20 past four. Thank you. And let's hear one more time for Kuop and Bruce. Thanks, Tech. Thank you.